All right, everyone, thanks so much for joining us. We're gonna go ahead and get started with the policy panel. Um, my name is Katie Siegel. I'm a master's in public policy student at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and I've had the honor of working with these folks over the past few months to help organize this panel. Um, today's panel will explore how policy and regulation can give traction to circular markets. The first session, or the first portion of the session will be a debate format, and the second portion will be an open discussion about policy. The motion for the debate is international trade or domestic circular markets? Where does the future of recycling lie? Let's begin by meeting our panelists. So today's panel will be moderated by Siddharth Srikant, a master's student at Harvard Kennedy School as well. And experts joining us on the panel are Yorgos Dimitriou, director of the Circular Economy Research Center and professor of circular economy at Ecole des Ponts Business School. Mario Jales, an economist at the UN Conference on Trade and Development. Juliana Torta, environmental counselor at the delegation of the EU to the United States. And Mark Wu, a professor at Harvard Law School. And we also have, due to travel restrictions, joining us by video, Shunta Yamaguchi, who is a policy analyst at the OECD Environment Directorate. Please welcome me in joining them to the stage. Wonderful, so um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the policy panel at the inaugural Harvard Circular Economy Conference. Um, as Casey mentioned, we have a fantastic lineup of panelists, but we are trying something different from some of the other panels. Uh, we'll start with a debate, like Casey mentioned. Uh, the motion is international trade, on my right, uh, or domestic circular markets, on my left. Where does the future of recycling lie? And we recognize that it's probably a bit of both, um, but the debate really is around where the emphasis should be as we look um, to react to some of the developments we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, many of you will be familiar with the context of this motion. Um, over several decades, recycling markets have become increasingly global as developed countries um, expanded their recycling programs and long distance shipping became economical. Uh, developing countries, particularly in Asia, became hubs for global recycling. Uh, and this was across a range of materials from plastics to paper to textiles and electronics. Um, as we heard earlier today, China's national sword policy did change the rules of the game. Um, starting in 2018, the country's stringent restrictions on um, waste imports completely reshaped trade in the recycling space. Uh, and developed countries scrambled to find alternatives back in 2018. We're now two years on from that. And other markets, such as Malaysia and Indonesia, are now also cracking down on waste imports. Um, we see countries taking coordinated action through the Basel Convention um, to more tightly regulate waste trade. So this motion really is quite timely. Uh, should countries um, continue to push international trade as a way of creating circular economies, or should the focus instead be on building stronger domestic circular markets? Um, the panels will, will follow a pretty basic format, and we'll have two speeches each from the proposition and opposition, and we'll have a summary speech by um, Yogos, uh, but before we begin with our panelists here, we, we'd like to start with a video statement from Shunta Yamaguchi, who's our first speaker on the international side. He couldn't be with us here today, but he's very kindly joining by video. Good morning. I'm Shunta Yamaguchi from the Environment Directorate of the OECD. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this very interesting event and uh, many apologies for not being able to make it in person because of the widespread of the coronavirus. I'd like to start um, by saying that at the OECD, we started to work on trade and circular economy since 2018. And it really started with one, at one meeting where one trade expert said that we need a free trade of waste as a valuable resource. And then at the same meeting, one environmental official said, Oh, that's terrible because uh, waste will end up in uh, sinks, the cheapest sinks available in the world and far corners in the world. In this debate and sitting on the side of the proposition of trade, but I'm not here to say that we would like to see waste trade without any conditions. It's really about to strike the right balance between trade and environment, uh, assuring uh, the comparative advantage and the economies of scales for waste as a valuable resource while also ensuring uh, the uh, environmental sound management of waste when they reach end of life. So what can we actually do? Um, this is really uh, difficult because waste trade can happen between countries 
where there are differences in environmental policy stringency, they tend to shift from uh, where the environmental policy stringency high uh, to, to lower countries. And we also see that the recipient tends to have more environmental pressure. There's also a complication with the informal sector and illegal waste trade that we need to take into account. But we also need to see two sides of the coin. So how do we uh, weed out the trade that we do not want to see, for instance, trade in hazardous waste? Uh, while also ensuring to facilitate that trade that we do want to see, such as trade in secondary materials. So this is about uh, the balance we want to achieve. Uh, the world right now is pretty much with a lot of developments on the first side, trying to restrict trade that we don't want to see. We see that, for instance, in uh, the uh, China import bans, also the Basel amendments, and also the EU Green Deal that was announced last December. Um, so in terms of trying to shift towards a more circular economy, we want to uh, ensure uh, to make a distinction between the trade that we don't want and the trade that we do want. How can we actually do this? Currently, with the harmonized system codes, the trade codes that we have in place, doesn't offer this type of granularity. So uh, do we need some kind of uh, amendments or resolutions to this? However, this is also very difficult because this is an extremely lengthy process. It could be uh, they're uh, revised every five years and they could go from five years up to 10 years. So in this case, what else can we actually do uh, as a practical solution? Uh, one way could be uh, the prior informed consent between the two trading partner, uh, partners, but we also hear from the industry uh, that this is also quite a lengthy process, uh, more than what's actually uh, uh, stated on paper. So we not need to ensure uh, that this process or these schemes are implemented very well, and also uh, try to see what kind of technologies or digital technologies there is currently today to actually facilitate this, for instance, uh, digitalized custom procedures. One very important point I'd like to make is that uh, we had this workshop on trade and circular economy, and although there is proposition and opposition on both sides to waste trade, there was pretty much a consensus that uh, each side agrees that we do not want illegal waste trade. So uh, to try to prevent this, we need uh, more uh, enforcement domestically, and we also need international cooperation in this area. So thank you very much. I wish you a fruitful discussion uh, in the due course of today. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, our next speaker will be uh, Juliana Torta from the delegation of the EU to the US. Um, Juliana, take it away. Thank you very much. I think it's already on. Thank you very much, and it's a huge pleasure to be here. It's an honor, and um, I, I will try to tell you in a few minutes what the EU is doing. But first of all, I fully share what the colleagues from OECD said. And the fact that we are on the opposition doesn't mean that we are, we, we may be challenging each other, but we are talking about two sides of the same coin. Being circular doesn't mean, and working on domestic side, doesn't mean that you do not want trade. You want trade which is regulated and which ensures social and environmental clauses in the agreements that you negotiate. Um, we heard a lot about circular economy already, um, definitions and concerns, ideas, areas for improvements. You can consider the EU as a kind of guinea pig because we have been working on that for five years. Our first circular economy action plan was developed in 2015. Uh, you can find on the web um, a report about which is assessing the implementation of these five years. So if you're curious to see what has been working, what didn't work so well, and the areas for improvement, you have it at your disposal. And I think it's a document that can be very important for you that you work on the research side. Um, next week, Tuesday, I think, we will have the new Circular Economy Action Plan presented by the European Commission, introducing new sectors, so textile and construction are two sectors that will be in focus. 
there will be something specific on microplastics, there will be the information technology and the electronics contained. So these are partly some gaps that we had in the first action plan that we managed to fill with this new proposal coming up next week. Because it is a new proposal coming up, I don't have the details with me. I, I cannot disclose, and also I don't know it. I didn't receive any drafts. It's, it's not, it's, you cannot, you're not supposed to have leakage documents, and I don't have it, actually. <laughs> I don't have it, I'm not hiding. But um, what you can expect, it, I wouldn't expect to see new legislative proposals, but really how we tackle the problem and a list of actions. In the first um, iteration of the action plan, we had 54 actions that have been all delivered with more or less success that depends on, on the topic. There was an emphasis on waste, on the waste management. Uh, but also on the product design. And the design of the products is very much in focus in the second edition that you will read next week. Building on what was said before, somebody mentioned it's important to, to work with the consumers. And, and it's true. Circular economy, and particularly if you see the circular economy within the European Green Deal, which is the new frame for the EU to work over the next five years and beyond, we need to make consumers more aware of their rights. We need to make them aware of the chains, how the chains of production are managed and give more transparency to them. And also to empower consumers on their choices. This is not contained in the circular economy action plan per se, but we have other action on that. And I'm saying that because I've been in the US now for years and I noticed quite a big difference between the level of awareness of the consumers in Europe and of course in Europe you have, we had 28 member states, now we have 27, but we still hope that <laughs> the number will increase in the future. And, and those that left come back, but let's see. Uh, the level, so you have a lot of differences also in the EU, but compared to the US, really our consumers are more aware and they demand more. And because the law of the market, both two sides, it's not just the industry of the business putting products, but it's also what the consumers demand. And that could be a game changer. It's very important to take this into account. And also defend consumer and maybe give something back to the consumer. If you are really good in separating your waste, why not giving also some incentives to the consumer instead of only asking and putting more taxes and asking to pay for the separated collection? So there are a lot of discussion in Europe for that. And the other shock being here for years was also this single stream for waste collection. Um, I'm in Washington, D.C. I keep making my own effort of separating everything, but then when I go into my building, everything goes together. So, I mean, I've just been wasting a lot of time. I'm just doing it because I'm used to that and I cannot put everything together. It's really culturally now for me is impossible. So that's as a citizen. Um, so I think... There is another big reason for embracing circular economy at domestic level, and it is that if you compare to data of the 1970s, we are using three times the resources that today that we were using at that time. So we don't have three planets, so resources are limited. So we need to make an effort all together to put them more and to use them more in circuit. And um, I think I'll stop here and I continue later on. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker on the proposition side supporting international trade is Mario Jalis. Uh, Mario is from UNCTAD and will introduce himself in a second. Well, good morning. Um, as Sid mentioned, I am from the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. So we are known by the acronym UNCTAD. Our headquarters is in Geneva. And our specialty within the UN family is to work with trade and development. So we work very closely with developing countries. So I would like to start by saying that we are delighted to be one of the sponsors of this event. Also to thank the organizers for the excellent job. I'm very impressed by all the pre-events and the, the event itself. And also to express the sincere apologies of director Pamela Coke Hamilton. She was supposed to be here and she couldn't come like our colleague from OECD, because of coronavirus-related travel restrictions. So apologies for that. Um, like I said, UNCTAD has a focus on developing countries, and we do trade and development. So I think the link between 
us and be on this side of the, of the debate on the propositions very clear to identify. But like my predecessors, I don't think that it's one side or the other. Both sides are important. They complement each other. So I think that ultimately it seems that some of the ideas on both sides of the debate are very close. But um, I would also try to focus on the current problem that we've been facing since China imposed this war policy has to do with the fact that China is also trying to deal with its own domestic problems. So China has traditionally not given too much attention to recycling. Now the government has a very strong focus into becoming, on creating a clean, cleaner cities, a cleaner society, and they want to invest in on, on recycling. And they were faced with this issue, but also with the issue of that part of the trade that was happening before was illegal or contaminated products that created problems for China. And there could have been better solutions to the trade ban, but it was the easiest solution for China. So to understand what happened, I think we need to understand that China has the desire to develop its own domestic industry, something that has been done in many other economic sectors to develop sectors. So China wants to do that now. It has a plan that's already in place that between 30 and 40 cities are going through a, uh, intense training of citizens to recycle products. And in addition to that, it was it chose the easiest way to deal with the illegal trading waste, which is just to prohibit any trading waste. It's not optimal, but it was easier for them to apply. So um, one of the things that we can look into is what different stakeholders can do to make trade in waste more successful. I think from the exporting countries or the source countries, there's a lot that can be done. So countries could invest in guaranteeing that their, their exports are not going through illegal channels or that they're not exporting, let's say, highly contaminated products that ultimately are just landfilled once they get at the, or, or at the destination country. That's something that's very important, especially since the recent uh, amendment to the, uh, the Basel um, treaty that Sid mentioned. I think countries now, the exporting countries are more, pro I mean, the recipient countries are more protected by this and the origin countries have stringent obligations on their part. Also because now if a country, a recipient country declares that the, the shipments are contaminated, the origin country is required to take it back. So it's, it's easier to deal with this issue of the illegal trade. But that's only one thing that the origin countries can do. Also, origin countries are usually much higher, much more advanced technolog technologically. And many of the recipient countries, they don't really have infrastructure in place. So I think the more advanced countries can spread technology and know-how and in investment. And when we think that in our world today, um, there's a dramatic change of what a developing country is. You know, if we're talking about 20 years ago, this, the difference between developing and developing was much starker than today, because today we have some developing countries like China that have very advanced sectors. So it's important to take that into consideration too. And that China can also derive economic uh, growth from recycling, but that's what they were doing. But now they decided to high, increase their standards, which is something that the developed world cannot complain, because they already have higher standards as well. So I think that ultimately, um, there's a lot that the origin countries can do, but also that the recipients country can do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we now have Professor Mark Wu from the Harvard Law School to make the second speech in defense of domestic secular economies. So thank you very much. Um, before my four minutes start, I just want to highlight two things. Uh, first of all, I was recruited onto this side. Um, I thought when I was coming to this panel that we were just going to have a discussion, but uh, like a good law professor, I teach my students that you should be able to take any side's argument and understand that. So I'm going to try to model that for my students. Um, <laughs> The second thing that I just want to note is um, clearly, like everyone else here, I teach international trade. So clearly, I must think trade is important. Otherwise, I wouldn't devote my life to teaching those type of rules. I serve on uh, several international trade uh, advisory boards and so forth. Um, so clearly, uh, I do think trade is important. Uh, but that being said, uh, this is a debate, and I will treat it as a debate and make my side's arguments very forcefully. So here we go, okay? <laughs> um, 
the question here is very simple, okay? Um, and it's one that those in the proposition have failed to clarify for you, right? Each one of you here has a couple of minutes each week to devote towards activism. The question here is, should you devote that activism to pressuring our governments to put pressures on other governments to open up their markets for recyclable and other types of waste? Or should you spend that limited time that you have, right, away from your families, away from your studies and so forth, and push our governments to turn our own economy more circular? It seems pretty simple to me, right? The problem here is us, and the problem is we need to turn our own lives and our own um, daily uh, ecosystem into a much more circular form, right? The problem does not lie in the fact that China is no longer taking our recycling. It doesn't lie in the fact that, right, Indonesia, instead of using new chemical products, they should take our recycled chemical forms, right? The problem is simply us. And trade works when there are two sides that both want something and they're not that efficient in producing it and they can be more efficient exchanging it. The problem here is there is something being produced that the world does not want. Right? And so let me just run through this very simple analogy in your head. Imagine the person to your right, right, for some freak accident, right, uh, defecated eight times more than you did. Okay? And they said to you, if I put this down my toilet, it will clog. But if, we, if you take some of this and you put it down your toilet, it will be much more efficient and nothing will clog. And you know, you don't have to put it down the toilet. You can turn it into fertilizer. You can sell it. It's good for you. Um, can I pay you to do this? And how much would you take this for, right? That is essentially the nature of the problem we have here, okay? And so if you can pay someone to take it, certainly that's the case, but the problem is, right, we need to solve, you would say, right, we need to come up with a medical solution to your problem. <laughs> Right? It's not a question of how much more do we pay so we make the toilet exchanges more efficient. It's not a can we design a more technologically efficient toilet that can handle eight times more defecation. Okay? So the answer at the end of the day is we, need, we ourselves have a consumption problem in the West. Right? We consume five times more waste than the average Chinese or the average Indian. Right? If, um, China, the manufacturing powerhouse that it is, produces four times uh, one-fourth the amount of hazardous waste that we do here in the United States on a per capita basis, right? And I'm talking here on a per capita basis. So even if every Chinese brought their waste level up to a Dane, right, up to a Dane, not to an American, right, the amount of new waste being introduced in the world would um, more than uh, be that of the U.S., EU, and Japan combined. So when China, if we're saying trade is the answer, we need to face up to the fact the last 25 years were an anomaly, right? Asia was growing so fast that it couldn't keep up with the production that it could take this waste. But the next 25 years, Asia is going to become a recycling powerhouse. And if we think trade is the answer, the world is gonna get flooded with recyclable goods, the prices are gonna go down even further, right? That certainly cannot be the answer. Right? The answer lies simply in the fact that right, we ourselves have a consumption problem. We ourselves need to find ways to make the West more circular, and we need to start modeling behaviors better than what we see even in Scandinavia, right, if we really want to bring the world to a more sustainable basis. That's not even to touch on right, what we're trading. Right? The panel touched on earlier right, in terms of agriculture, the types of the costs that are involved in terms of shipping things across distances, uh, the, right, the fossil fuels that are being burned in terms of doing all that. Right? Trade is not the answer. The limited time that you have, spend that on making sure that we consume less, right? we reuse more, and at the end of the day, we certainly consume more and lead more circular lives. So thank you very much. <laughs> so thanks very much for that spirited defense of domestic circularity. Um, we now have um, Yorgos Dimitriou uh, who will give us a summary speech, sort of um, explaining the themes of this debate and giving us his take on where we're headed in the second half of this term. Well, um, I wouldn't even dare rephrase in your example. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, but um, th there's been an interesting discussion between the two um, aspects, which, um, at least to my understanding, um, although both uh, sides tried to debate their part, uh, accidentally or, uh, I don't know, um, um, on purpose, they included both of them. My, my ears heard that, you know, this is um, um, a global problem, 
uh, which qualifies for local solutions uh, and collaboration is needed because if we start thinking about the, the end result, the end impact, for example, the impact on climate change, the climate is one. There is not um, uh, Asia climate, European climate, and US climate. So eventually the measures that we are taking should um, foster the solutions towards the environment. Now, um, going a little bit to the arguments of the colleagues, I, I, I would um, definitely agree that we are lacking a number of instruments to um, uh, enable this to happen or to control it or to foster more collaboration. At the same time, um, the colleague from the EU might mention that, yeah, let's use the EU as a guinea pig. Um, uh, actually, uh, th that is true in the sense that um, EU has made a very daring step ahead in the circular economy um, in the past uh, five, six years, and, um, and this has already uh, shown some actionable items and some results of fostering uh, not only national initiatives but European collaboration as well. And we are just a small portion of this planet. Um, same for, for my colleague from the United Nations. We, we all understand that this issue um, has its local and international dimensions. You cannot uh, attend to this problem locally and expect it to be addressed internationally. Um, that's not, not how it works. So um, um, the same goes for um, um, the very inspirational uh, um, examples from the professor at the end of the table. Uh, it is true that it is, it's, it's not just the, the market-driven situation. We have to account for other things as well. Uh, and we need to in, in, in see the interest of each side. So um, in, in conclusion, I think we're lo we looking for a, a, a more hybrid approach that includes both aspects, local solutions that uh, can, empower for, can empower the international landscape, but the other way around as well, uh, the international lands landscape to empower the, um, the local solutions. So um, I'm, I'm sure that both sides are, have good arguments, and I, I would tend to say that uh, there's no winner in this uh, discussion. I think that um, the winner in this discussion is, is this audience that are able to understand a little bit that, guys, we need to look at many aspects if we want to, to make this right. Thank you very much. So now we'll move into the panel portion of this discussion. We have time for questions, but I'm gonna kick off with uh, an introductory question. Uh, I'd love to hear from our panelists today some of what you've been doing in your work. Uh, and one example of a policy that you think has been really effective in driving forward circularity anywhere in the world. Um, we can start down the table with Nadia. Okay, um, at UNCTAD, we have partnered with DFID, um, the Department for International Development of the United Kingdom. And in this project, which is called Sustainable Manufacturing and Environmental Pollution, SMAP, and it's focused on reducing, like the title says, uh, environmental pollution by addressing manufacturing sectors in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So there's some specific countries that are priority countries. And as part of this, there will be research and develop, development funding to find solutions to manufacturing problems and also to address the specific issue of plastics. So I think through this project, which is started in just a few months ago, it has a five-year implementation period, we will be contributing to addressing some of these issues of um, circularity. Um, we would like also to spread the word, word about this project to the audience. Um, and we look forward to, to achieving good results of this project. It's only in the starting phase right now. But I think this is how at UNCTAD we are entering the world of uh, uh, circular economy with also the goal of providing technical assistance to the countries at the end. So there will be a whole process of research with partner institutions um, to develop solutions. And at a later stage, the UN will step in to provide technical assistance to the countries to try to implement these solutions on the ground. Perfect. I'm just not going to let you go. One example of policy you think has been really effective anywhere in the world at any level? Well, some, the Netherlands, uh, we, are, we have representatives here from the EU. The Netherlands um, has had some more, let's say, aggressive policies about selection of, of waste. Mm -hmm. 
And the Netherlands was also cited as an example of a country by not putting everything in one bin like some other countries, that they were less affected by the China ban or all, all by, this, by all these restrictions. So this type of approach, uh, it was mentioned before earlier today of not putting everything together. And also in some constituencies, there are policies in place to try to create a stimulus for countries to reuse products. So it was even mentioned by our colleague from Denmark, like have a certain percentage of materials that should be reused. Or even say that um, create tax incentives if you are to use uh, reuse products. These type of policies have been used to create incentives for other sectors in the past. You know, today we talk a lot about circular economy. 10 years ago we talked a lot about biofuels. And biofuels were not competitive. The US today is a major player in biofuels, even though their biofuels have their own problems, their own environmental problems, but the US was not competitive at producing biofuel. The government created these two types of policies, tax incentives and a minimum percentage of the, the gasoline that they had to have ethanol. And through that, the US became competitive. They are, they're competitive at the, at the market and they don't need those subsidies anymore. They don't exist. So it's a su successful uh, example of how policies helped develop the demand and the supply and all that. Not necessarily that it was a success successful policy to go towards that, but the government was able to implement uh, rules that helped the development of a sector that could be used in, in the case of recycling as well, or the circular economy in general. Yeah. Uh, well, um, uh, allow me to just deviate for 10 seconds and, and take some um, three statements from what we heard before. One, the, the gentleman who said, I've been uh, uh, dealing with circular economy for six months, but actually I realized that it's like 10 years. Um, and uh, from our keynote speaker about the complexity to regulate. And by Tom, this, uh, the statement about it will take uh, some time and considerable effort to make this happen. Um, I'm making this introduction because I've been involved at some time in, in circular economy um, and uh, I've been part of the um, uh, expert group of the European Commission in developing the, the, um, the, the guidance for the financing of, of circular economy. And three groups that we have uh, come up with it was uh, recommendations to policymakers, recommendations to financial institutions and recommendations to, um, um, to project uh, owners. Uh, pretty much like the structure you have today. Um, and um, the other thing that um, that came to into action is that, you know, we, we started realizing that at least in Europe intensively we have been talking about um, circular economy because of the policy action of the European Commission introducing the uh, circular economy action plan. Now, how does this link with us uh, being a, an academic institution? Well, it links directly because um, uh, the European Commission directly uh, in, injected some funds into research. And we got some of these funds, and one of the projects that we are running is it's called CIOT, meaning Circular Economy and Internet of Things, which I related quite a lot myself with the example of the colleague um, um, here, as you, uh, I don't remember the name, um, about the um, uh, uh, a company that they're using the RFIDs, the uh, IOT, to, to do their business model. Uh, and actually, we, we didn't see it from from this specific angle, we said it in a more general uh, angle that you will need some such of these frameworks uh, to go ahead. So for us, the, the, the answer to, to for us the, as a policy uh, was the, um, the, the action plan of the European Commission, uh, obviously. Um, but at the same time, what we, what we have seen is that and we need to, to understand is that circular economy is not an exact science. I mean, it's not what we, are, what we used to say. Uh, uh, it's an amalgamation of many disciplines. We need to start understanding this more and more. There is no real body of knowledge coming from 20, 50 years ago on circular economy. This body of knowledge is coming from different disciplines and this is what we see more and more. And it will need a little bit of a, a different uh, line of thought to shift it. And this is exactly the group of people and initiative, and allow me here to say that my, my warmest congratulations for the event that you are organizing, that allows us to di discuss and debate. And, and, and actually, we didn't know about your, your, your work, but we're so happy uh, because we are working on a broader framework for this kind of, of companies, because at some point when this will happen and will become broader, what, guess what will happen? Policy will be needed, regulation will be needed, 
and many other things will be needed. So the, the frameworks need to start existing, and this is why, as academic institutions, we are very happy, and also we're very happy for for your presentations, which give us a lot of food for thought for next um, um, uh, uh, endeavors. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia. We heard a bit about your work, but we love your thoughts as well. Yes, I have to say, if I have to pick one uh, policy. I would say plastic. Plastic is um, was already contained as a thematic strategy in the circular economy action plan, but then because of a push in interest also from, as I was saying, from uh, consumers, from think tanks, from the civil society, there was a new legislation and including the ban on some of the single-use plastic last year and produced in nine months. And producing a, a new piece of legislation in nine months usually takes much longer than <laughs> producing a baby to, to, <laughs> to develop new, new policy and new legislation. So it was quite a success for the services. Um, it made it in the agenda of the G7 and the G20 as marine litter. So if it's not mentioned plastic, it's the marine litter word which is used. And then it triggered all the consideration related to the microplastics, which is a, another huge problem because basically we drink microplastics every day. And that's something that we are, many people are not aware. Um, so absolutely, I would say the plastic and the microplastic related to that. Fantastic. Professor Wu? Um, great. Uh, as I mentioned, um, my work is actually predominantly in trade. So I work uh, quite a bit with um, different stakeholder, multi-stakeholder forums. Uh, one of those being uh, the US Trade and Environment Policy Advisory Committee. So we're looking at how do we bring more environmental including circular economy components into U.S. trade agreements. Another is uh, I work with the World Economic Forum's uh, Global Futures Council on trade, in, uh, on trade and investment, and so we have a circular economy initiative there. Um, what I want to highlight in terms of, uh, I think, I just want to double click on two things that I think folks on the panel have said. One is I think um, the consumer awareness building initiatives, I think the plastics is a fantastic example of that, uh, where you can certainly see attitudes changing, but that's through a sustained consumer awareness campaign that just happened to find the right angle to make it simple enough um, for especially young people to really push for that change. Uh, the second is I think there are market distortions right now where the, uh, the externalities aren't captured in the price, and so you do need governments to step in, whether it's through uh, mandatory uh, reuse uh, requirements or through subsidies or some form to push corporates towards the innovation that's necessary on the technology side. And then the third initiative I think I want to highlight is I do think um, uh, this is going to be much more uh, stakeholder led as opposed to government driven. And I think there is room and we have seen this where um, corporates get together set a set of standards that make it much more efficient to engage in reuse and trade and so forth. And I think there's much more work to be done there, but that's the other policy initiative that I would highlight that I think we can put a lot more emphasis on. Fantastic. Um, should we switch to a couple of questions from the audience? Uh, do we have any from the virtual audience? We can try that first. No. Um, let's go in for the in-room audience then. Hi, my name is uh, Priya Krishnamurti. I'm a Fulbright Scholar from India. And my focus area is uh, the creative economy. Um, all the leaders here and all the panelists here have spoken about in incentivizing com consumer behavior and finding more effective ways to share information. Um, but we don't really find um, actors within the creative economy part of conversations like this on sustainability. For example, media, film, digital content, areas like those are some of the biggest influencers um, and of behavior and disseminator of information today. But uh, as leaders, do any of your policies and strategies take into account solutions within the creative economy that need to be supported? Was that for someone specific or for the panel as a whole? Perfect. Maria? Well, I am trying to think here as I hear the question of, um, at UNCTAD specifically, we are not working right now on, on the interlinks between creative economy and the circular, creative economies and circular economies. Um, 
So maybe one of the other panelists would have something to, to say on that. I can tell you that there are many examples of when doc, document, doc, documentaries or initiatives from the media have huge impact on public opinion and the opinion of, of leaders. So that's like what, what you said, that there's not as much of it, but there is some of it. And just recently I heard from a colleague from the UK on how a recent documentary by the BBC on the pollution of oceans and all that motivated the British government to react very quickly. And part of our project is a reaction of this. So money became available for, for dealing with the issues of plastics. But the, I, I wouldn't have, we, ha, we don't have a project or a experience directly linked to creative economies that I could tell you. Yeah, and this is done by the member countries of the UN. So at the, at the country level, some countries are more aggressive than others in doing this. I think the European Union, like was mentioned by our colleague Julia, has, in other European countries, has, and other geographies in Europe have achieved more in, in communicating this to the publics. But um, I think it's definitely something extremely important is that it's the key of addressing these issues, right? So it also has a connection with, um, um, for example, in agriculture, when we talk about the seals of demonstrating that a product is produced um, efficiently. In Europe today, those are almost commonplace. It's almost hard to find a chocolate that doesn't have a seal that says, oh, this was produced from um, child, uh, child labor free cocoa or deforestation free cocoa. So at one point, I think that the circular economy campaign will also, should also move in this direction. Um, if I can add, in, um, in the commission there is a specific program which is called me the media program. And th there are um, funds for the creative industry, so including cinema or production of documentaries. And some of these uh, topics were treated as like um, publicity spots or specific um, I don't say public, yeah, publicities. I'm not aware of uh, specific documentaries that have been funded with public, only with public funds by the European Commission, but um, I, I can look into that. But there, there is, I mean, the creative industry is covered by incentives as well. And um, going back to what also the colleague was saying, and um, it's true that this attention on plastic was very much linked to the famous documentary from David Attenborough, The Blue Planet, that was really a triggering point to raise awareness at global level. Mm -hmm. And the last note, South to Southwest is the place where you have all this creative industry represented. And for, for the first time this year, they have, I think it's the first time they have the sustainability as an overall concept. And for the first time we had prepare, and I was preparing a panel on uh, sustainability and recycling and reuse. Uh, the problem now is to see if it is confirmed. So if, if it is confirmed, then we, will, we could hook the circular economy into the program of South to Southwest, which the idea I think was very good, but let's see. And let's not forget that the BBC documentary Blue Planet was publicly funded. The BBC is a public broadcaster, so there's that. Um, can, can I add one thought here? I think uh, what your question triggered for me is, it's interesting if you think about the media side on climate change, versus circular economy and how far we've come on climate change in terms of making people aware of the problem and how we haven't yet done that in circular economy. So I'm sure sitting in this audience here are folks who like you work on creative content. And what I wanna highlight is I think if you really think about it until I had to take this on debate, I didn't even know how much I as an American produce more in waste. Right, or I thought of a European as being right leading on this, but you don't even think about how much a European produces more in waste compared to say even a Brazilian or an Indian and so forth. So I think there is a sense of just making right the West aware of how much we are the problem here 
that I think really needs to be done for folks in the creative economy in order for us to even shift our mindset towards recycling by itself is not enough, right? Uh, sorting and composting by itself is not enough. And that hasn't really happened in the creative economy. And then the second part is there's the other side, which is uh, other societies that you don't want to develop these bad habits. And there on creative content, I think it's a mismatch between where the funds are and the so forth because there is not that much that's being produced. Uh, out for markets in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in Asia, and so forth, that's targeted in those languages with those people, right? The content is still largely produced in the West. And so it's for those of you who will go into nonprofits thinking about allocating it that way, spending your time training people to do that, to produce that type of content. And so it's really, uh, I think we have a long ways to go. Wonderful. Um, we do have a virtual audience question. Uh, Ooh, we also have more than 100 people online at the moment, which is fantastic. Um, so I have a question from Emma Barrett, who is a high school student from Philadelphia, and her question actually ties in with your answer. She's asking, much of the discussion has been focused on the progress the European Union has made, but what do you believe the United States can do to advance their role in promoting domestically or international circular economy, given the current political and social climate? Yes, do you want to go? Um, okay. Um. <laughs> Actually, to, to respond to that question, uh, um, I would say it, it, this is not a um, circular economy, taking up actions about circular economy, this is not a, an issue about governments or about uh, industry, it's, it's a collective uh, um, responsibility. So the mere fact that we're having this conference already today here, that's the solid proof that, that at the uh, US we're taking um, some steps. As well as um, the, our keynote speaker mentioned about the upcoming uh, World Circular Economy Forum that will uh, take place in Canada. Uh, uh, next week, there is the, the World uh, Circular City Week, which is uh, taking place in New York. Uh, and also, part of my team will be there as well, uh, proving that European, um, US, uh, you know, this, uh, the collaboration has started. So it's not that, that, that uh, the US um, um, has left behind or Europe is ahead. Also, we heard before from the colleagues here, they have a course, four years started, if I'm, I'm saying it correct, yep, four years uh, uh, already going. So uh, these are the, 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 the measures that um, prove that uh, there are things going on. And I'm, I'm certainly sure that um, in the next uh, few years we will see a more, uh, um, I would even say, radical um, measures taken because uh, of consumer pressure, of climate change, and and by people becoming more sensitive and pushing the markets uh, and, and pushing the, the, the policy makers in order to be able to achieve these kind of results. So it's a global issue and let me uh, remind that it's a global issue and, um, and steps are being taken all over the place. Um, the example of China that you just mentioned on, on becoming, let's say, more sensitive in recycling, this is just the one mere example that um, um, th uh, steps are being taken at the global level. I mean, you know, one reflection I had hearing all of you speak is this feels more, given we had two sides of the debate, this feels like a more bipartisan issue. Mm -hmm. In a sense, climate change has become a bit more polarizing. Uh, there, are, there are ways in which that's heading, but at least in terms of a clean environment and waste reduction, uh, it feels like from what you've said, there is still potential to um, bridge partisan divides like that question was hinting at. Uh, and the US certainly is um, facing some of those challenges, but it feels like it could be overcome. We have one more question from, oh, sorry, yeah. No, if I, even if European, if I can say something about what the US is doing, because they have two very interesting developments. One is um, the Senate uh, approved uh, the Save Our Seas Act 2.0, and you have a splendid definition of circular economy. So you have a brilliant definition of circular economy in the US context there. Now, the point is to see if it will pass the House. There are six or seven committees working on that, but if it does, and it, there is a strong bipartisanship, it's a fantastic achievement. And the other one, um, this is more a dead on arrival. There is a bill which was um, presented by Senator Udall from New Mexico, and it's called Recover, the Recover Act. And it's exactly about uh, strengthening the recycling facilities in the US. And also, I think, introducing some extended producer responsibility. And that's, of course, something that the industry doesn't want to hear about. So that's most likely it will fail. The senator is aware about that. But nevertheless, he said it's important to show that there is a political willingness to start debating this at Congress level. 
And if I can complement, going beyond the government, how the private sector internationally is now investing in the US. So once these restrictions were placed in, uh, by the Chinese government, these companies simply didn't have their input, which was Western ways to process. So many of them have acquired facilities, they're investing in the US to process US waste in the United States. So the world re reacts quickly. So trade is not just sending products uh, over borders, there's services, there's technology, there's investment. And the private sector is already reacting to that. And Chinese investment is coming into the United States and they're setting up uh, facilities, recycling facilities here. And in Japan as well. That's right. Yeah. Senior, I'm a fellow at the Weatherhead Center. It's just a comment, not a, really a question, based on the uh, previous question about the connection between creative and circular economies. Uh, creativity has always been a way to upcycle things, to add value, and also empower communities around the world. And I just heard uh, that uh, the the General Assembly, uh, as part of the Economic and Social Council in New York uh, of the United Nations, will hold uh, the Youth Forum 2020 on a April 2nd, exactly on this theme. So youth, circular economy, and creative economy stepping up actions. So I think you can even participate if you want. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, one more question? Oh, so we had one in the room, actually. Let's take one from the room. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, my name is Goda Bapuchi, and um, my question is around um, holding people responsible, the right people responsible. Domestic offshore manufacturing use the economic and development zone policies and regulatory breaks whilst recusing themselves from the obligations of waste management from their production cycles in the host nations. Um, I'm interested to know what tangible steps have been taken domestically to hold such corporations responsible for their actions offshore. Was that for a specific panelist? Um, it's open to everybody, but uh, my focal points were most uh, domest the domestic group. Perfect. Um, so, so actually, you touched on um, you touched on something that's actually difficult to uh, take care of because. Um, what you touched on is in many countries there are these special economic zones with different forms of uh, regulations. Uh, and that also what you're touched on is also a sort of offshoring of the waste, right, in some form of washing and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, I think uh, th this is a political legislative, it requires a political legislative solution on either side, right? Either the country that's offshoring or the country that is creating these types of special economic zones. And you see interests on both sides really resist efforts to try to do that, right? So um, i hard pressed to, well, I can identify the problem for all of you as a good academic. I'm hard pressed to actually point to solutions other than to say there are um, political forces, right, that are pushing in this direction, right, more extraterritorial accountability. Uh, but unfortunately, we haven't seen that on the environment side as we do, say, human rights. There are some who've tried to transform this into a human rights issue, right, and then use those types of mechanisms for extraterritorial uh, education. But that has been resisted in many instances, especially in the U.S. Uh, on that side. And then on the other side, of course, right, there are political pressures uh, against creations of these types of SEZs, but these uh, creations of these special economic zones, it becomes a competition between different locations. And particularly where you have infrastructure problems, you have uh, unreliable rules of law and so forth, this becomes a way to attract foreign investment. So uh, that's, that's the scope of the landscape. No, I think, uh, I agree. I think it's more than domestic. I think it's also part of the trade dialogues and the trade bilaterals and multilateral debates. Um, so I don't know if the colleagues from UNCTAD, if you have something about this specific. Yeah, what came to my mind was this shift, recent shift, because um, in Europe, many countries have targets of uh, for pollution, for recycling and so on. And for many years, uh, when they could still export, Whenever they exported waste, it automatically counted as recycling. So they were they were filling in and checking the marks, saying that they were recycling when there's no mm -hmm. assurance that it was that recycling was ever taking place. And I think after the problem with China and all the Southeast Asian countries, Europe is more aware of that, and it's moving in a direction that that shouldn't happen anymore. That 
you couldn't count the mere fact of exporting as recycling. You need to take action to ensure that whatever happens to that shipment is done in a way that it's as good as what would be done in Europe, required by the laws in place in Europe. So I think the EU is moving towards that, which I think would have a good impact uh, in, in facilities, in processing zones like the ones you, you mentioned. I'll add, I have one more thought here, which is one tool that we have seen used in the trade context is something we call linkage. So to say, right, in exchange for trade preferences, lower tariff rates, uh, access to our markets, you must do X, right? We've seen this with other areas of environment. We've seen this with labor and so forth. But it also has a neo-colonial veneer that makes many people oftentimes um, very uncomfortable with this, right? So that is one tool that could be brought to bear on circular economy elements that has not yet been done, but it has been done in other areas, say, for example, fisheries, right? Um, managing comments on those side. Uh, we do have a question from the virtual audience. Johanna? We have way too many. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's one from Map90. I don't actually know his or her real name. Um, Single-use plastic sachets contribute to an immense plastic waste problem in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. These sachets are more affordable for poor and low-middle-income households. What are the panel's thoughts on single-use plastic sachets and ideas for circular economy in the Philippines and Southeast Asia? So a question on the trade-off between affordability and waste. Wanna go first? Um, that's quite a complex question. <laughs> it's just tough. Um, well, I mean, th there's no single direction on taking up this question because um, there is um, a give and take in every situation. So, um, I would say my 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 colleague is more like. Um, uh, let's say, in a position to talk about these kind of things, but certainly um, there are measures that can be taken whether you want to apply these kind of measures and whether they bring the right benefits. So it's not just by, uh, um, by uh, uh, let's say, association, whether you say, okay, this has been done there, we do it here, the same result will come out. Or whether we will use this like it has been done there, this has to be uh, come uh, out. Therefore, um, the, the complexity of, of extrapolating these examples to other regions with different cultures, other thoughts, uh, different regulatory schemes, policy schemes, and appetite of the consumer is much more different if you're talking about the regions that you just mentioned or Europe or the US. So we have to be very mindful in, in discussing about these kind of things uh, because it's not the one size fits all, uh, whether we're talking about policy measures, consumer measures, financial measures, um, even education. Um, they're very much uh, complex. So uh, I'm sorry for being broad, but um, um, giving a, a, an ex um, a response which uh, take the European example would give you um, uh, maybe wrong, wrong conclusions and that, that I wouldn't like to do here. But just keep um, um, the, 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 the thing that is not one size fits all, whether we're talking about uh, uh, policy actions or actual um, um, decisions of applying measures like the, the plastics policy. The one thing I did want to add, I used to work in plastic pollution reduction in Indonesia, and it's a really tricky problem because in places like Indonesia and the Philippines, it's a trade-off, it's a three-way trade-off really. It's between environmental protection, affordability, and food safety. And it is a scourge, honestly. There's so much plastic pollution, it's absolutely heartbreaking. But you can see why it exists. It is ultimately filling a need um, among low-income communities, and it is guaranteeing food safety for people who sometimes lack that. So I think when we discuss solutions, it's the onus really is on people with privilege to find the solutions that both meet their needs and advance the environmental goals that we have for ourselves. So that's just my reflection. Um, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, how long do we have, Casey? Two minutes. Um, I don't know. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Somewhere here. Yeah. Thank you. Hope this is going to be a good last question, uh, challenging us, you know, for the for the solutions. Um, I'm going to go back to what Shunta said in the very beginning. Um, what's the kind of trade we don't want, what you want to disencourage, and what's the trade we want, what do we want to encourage? And I guess for all sorts of reasons, uh, the trade we want to be encouraging is the trade in secondary raw materials. 
Um, but um, what I've learned last week is that that is really not happening at the moment with the speed we want it to happen. So OECD has done a study where they looked at the trade in primary raw materials and in secondary raw materials, and they say that the trade in raw materials, in secondary raw materials, will take over the primary raw material trade in around 2040. Surely that's way too late. So we've kind of heard from some policy solutions from the panel. I just wanted to say, given the urgency, how can we speed it up with policies? Because that's what it's about, you know, putting the right policies in place. So kind of a recapping a bit what you said before, but, you know, really something that really will speed this up um, so that, you know, we don't miss the 2030 mark. All right, as we wrap up, how do we speed this up? Let's go down the line. <laughs> Well, I think I can try to summarize some of the issues that are already said here, right? So we need to focus on media, on communicating, on getting consumers on board, making cir circular economy as well known as climate change and so on. We need to get governments to think of policies that are appropriate for their countries. They, those, could, those could be tax rebates or minimum percentage use of secondary materials or so on. We can think of transferring technologies to countries that don't have the technology yet, but they have low labor costs or other competitive advantages that they could, they become, they could become um, recycling centers as long as we're not dealing with unsustainable or legal trade and so on. I think there's, these are some of the, the issues we discussed here. Maybe my colleagues want to add a few. Well, I agree with everything. I just want to underline um, the, the the role that the technology plays in, in the evolution of everything we're discussing right now and think how we were discussing the same thing 10 years ago or how we would be discussing the same thing 10 years from now. And if you ask a researcher, an innovator has been doing applied research, uh, what, what were his tools 10 years ago and what are his tools today uh, to, to, uh, to make the same thing that, that are different. So I think that... Um, um, technology will have uh, a disruptive impact on uh, uh, expediting the process of uh, transforming everything um, that we are that we want to transform towards a circular economy paradigm uh, in um, in every uh, economic spectrum. Julia? I, I think it goes back to one of the first questions that was posed today about these externalities and how to play with incentives and taxation. Um, and it's something that it's very much also a national competence. So I think looking from the EU side, there are already a lot of instruments that our member states could use already. If it is popular or not is another question, because every time you talk about environmental taxation, then you probably lose the election and then you don't do it. But I think we have already the instruments. It's more a matter of political willingness. So I'll toss two out um, on the legal side. I think one is... Uh, not very popular in the United States, but certainly increasingly more popular in Europe, which is for markets to put on uh, border tax adjustments. Um, and so we've seen that with carbon, but you could certainly see that with inputs on raw materials and so forth. I think the second part has been, there have been other initiatives multilaterally or even amongst a set of like-minded countries to drive down barriers on trade or to set standards for certain things. And certainly one could do that with regards to these types of raw materials. But then I think what's important there is to hook it with saying you only get these benefits provided you hit these types of domestic targets. Otherwise, you're, as folks here have mentioned, you're really just offshoring the problem. Wonderful. Um, I'd like to ask you all to thank our panelists today. This has been a brilliant discussion. <laughs> Now's the...